Hello, welcome to lecture five. This covers week five and six. This chapter is probably one of the most important ones and covers a lot of material. I want to give you two weeks to really understand this lecture and to do the homework. Maybe get a little bit of a break and relax a bit. We previously discussed the business cycle, periodic fluctuations in the economy. Some periods we are doing well and our economy is expanding. In other not so lucky periods, the economy is contracting or constricting. These are indicate recessions if they're mild and depressions if they're particularly bad. The most recent recession or the most severe in recent memory was the 2008 and 2009 Great Recession. The unemployment jumped from 4.4 to 10 percent. This chapter we're going to delve deeper into the business cycle and how it fluctuates through the economy or what causes it. We will be using GDP, unemployment, interest rates, and the price level. We will also consider government spending, taxes, and money supply. Previously we used market demand and market supply models where we looked at a single good and its demand or and its supply or a specific industry's demand and supply. Well we are going to shift that to a macroeconomic lens and we're going to look at aggregate demand and our aggregate supply model it's going to function slightly differently than the ones we discussed before but first let's get into some key facts about the year-to-year -year economic fluctuations or key observations economic fluctuations fact number one economic fluctuations are irregular and unpredictable when real GDP grows rapidly business is good and these periods are economic expansions when it falls business is rough and indicates recessions previously when I discussed the business cycle I said it went up and down it may have been a bit misleading because it's incorrect to assume that these fluctuations follow a regular and predictable pattern economic fluctuations are not regular and are almost impossible to predict even our best forecasters are almost always wrong they they never actually hit the target that they said that we would hit or predicted that we would hit fact number two most economic data fluctuates together most of the macroeconomic variables will follow a similar trend let's assume the economy is doing well then investments gonna go up consumption is gonna go up real GDP is gonna go up net exports will probably increase government spending might be higher so all these macroeconomic variables might follow to at the same in the same trend they're all moving up maybe employment is following uh, is falling because the economy is doing well so we have more people employed so less unemployment fact number three as output falls unemployment rises output is production of goods and services if production decreases, you do not need as many workers. You may fire some or not hire some, but the result remains the same. Unemployment increases. Let's look at the figure in this book. The shaded regions represent recessions and other periods would be expansionary periods. The l longest period of expansion occurs from 2009, right at this end of reception, all the way until July 2019. Well, it continues past July 2019, probably until COVID just occurred. But previous to that, we had another extremely long expansion from 1991 all the way to 2001. Looking at this, looking at the third graph down here, we see that when recessions occur, unemployment increases, it spikes, it goes up because the economy isn't doing so well and people aren't going to be employed in a bad economy. And we can also see that when recessions hit particularly bad, investment spending typically decreases and real GDP may also decrease or maybe not increase as much. Let's explain short run economic fluctuations. 
to do this, we need to go over a few things. First, let's go over what we have been, what kind of model we've been using before. The assumption that in the long run, money does not matter is a classical economics idea. In classical economics, changes in the money supply affect nominal variables, but not real variables. Money does not matter to classical economics because if money were to double, prices would just double and wages would just double. So the quantity of money is irrelevant. According to the classical economists, what matters is the real variables behind the money. And the money is just the unit that we use to express variables. Are these assumptions like true? Do they hold in the real world? Maybe. We, n we, we think that the classical models explain the long run extremely well. But in the short run, this isn't really the case. Maybe in the short run that when money supply changes, short run fluctuations can actually increase production or decrease production. In so the assumption of monetarism neutrality is not appropriate. In the short run, nominal variables can affect real variables. They are highly intertwined. So much so that an increase in the money supply can temporarily push real GDP away from its long run trend. This isn't a new observation. Even as far back as the 18th century, David Hume noted, uh, he was an economist, noted that when gold was discovered, there was a delay to when prices increased. And in the meanwhile, the economy enjoyed higher employment and production. We're going to build a model that will ignore the previous assumptions made about money. It's going to, we don't need that assumption anymore because we're going to allow money to actually change our real variables. So let's start with this. On our y-axis, we're going to use the price level. So on the y-axis, we'll have price level. And this is going to be measured using the GDP deflator or the CPI, inflation, whatever price level. On the x-axis, we will use quantity of output. This can be measured through real GDP or production. We have a nominal variable on the y-axis. Price level is a nominal variable. And a real variable on the x-axis. And we are interested in the relationship between a nominal variable price level and a real variable GDP. You can tell we've already diverged from the classical or classical economist ideas. We're looking at how a price level interacts with a real variable. The aggregate demand curve shows the quantity of goods and services that household, firms, governments, and customers abroad want to buy at each pr price level. The aggregate supply curve shows the quantity of goods and services that firms produce and sell at each price level. According to this model, price level and output adjusts to bring aggregate demand and aggregate supply into balance. How is the graph going to look? It's going to look pretty similar. AD, you may be shocked to see, and AS. That it looks like the exact model of market demand and market supply, but it is entirely different. First, let's let's delve into both of these curves, these lines more in depth. We'll look at aggregate demand. The aggregate demand curve slopes downward. We know this to be true in the market case. But why is it true in the aggregated case? An aggregated is just a combination of 
all the different demands. So if you take all the demand from all the industries or all the goods and entire economy and added them together, it would be the aggregate demand. Similarly, the aggregate supply would be you took the supply for all goods and services in an economy and added them together. Consider the GDP equation that we discussed before. We had Y, our real GDP is equal to C plus I plus government purchases. Uh, C is consumption, I is investment, G is government purchases plus net exports. We can consider government purchases or government spending to be fixed, so we're going to ignore this. In the short run, policy doesn't typically change very much, so it's hard to change or see changes in government spending or purchases. Let's look at consumption first. It's the first one in our equation. And we'll see how price level changes based off, or how consumption changes based off price level. The nominal value of a dollar is fixed. If you have a $10 bill, even if inflation occurs, it's still a $10 bill. You just can't purchase as much. You can't buy as much. The real value of the $10 decreased, but the nominal value of the $10 remains the same. It's fixed. If the price level falls, the dollars you hold rise in value, increasing your real wealth and your ability to buy goods and services. So as price level goes down, we become wealthier because our $10 can buy more. If goods went from like let's say normally you bought a basket of goods for a hundred dollars and all of a sudden it dropped to ten dollars and you had a nominal ten dollar bill right that the ten dollar bill didn't actually change then all of a sudden your wealth your purchasing power increased drastically following this logic when price level decrease people are wealthier and people are wealthier it encourages them to buy more If we look at the graph, we can see that the demand line, as price level drops, the aggregate quantity demanded increases. GDP shifts to the right. So as the price level goes down, we're going to end up somewhere over here at a higher quantity or a higher GDP, higher, higher output. Let's make a graph for demand. price level and quantity what did I say was quantity of output I wasn't sure if it was produced or output so we'll or production quantity of output and we had our demand line that was just or our aggregate demand line that was just like this we go from P1 to P2. What? Why am I doing that? P2, right here. We can see what happens to quantity. So before we were at this point, at Q1. And now we are at price, so we'll draw a line straight across. And now we're at this point, Q2. As the price level dropped, quantity increased, or output increased. The next part of our equation, I'll rewrite it, y is equal to c plus i plus, we're going to ignore government spending, as I mentioned before net exports is investment when the price level drops households do not need to hold on to as much money as before because their purchasing power increased their wealth increased they don't need as much money as they needed before they're going to put their excess money into interest bearing bonds or interest bearing savings account and then the bank would use these funds to make loans in either case 
as households convert their money into interest-bearing assets, they drive down interest rates. In chapter 21, we're going to look more into this relationship. But a lower interest rate makes borrowing less expensive, so firms will borrow to invest into new plants or equipment, and households will buy more houses and cars. A lower price level reduces interest rates and encourages an increase in investment and consumer spending. Consumer spending, if they you know, buy loans for cars, they're going to get at a lower interest rate. Investment spending is going to increase from businesses wanting to buy assets, uh, capital, buildings, and also households buying houses. Lastly, let's look at the relationship between price level and net exports. When the interest rate drops, some U.S. investors may seek bonds from foreign countries so that they can earn more money. They sell their American bonds and buy, let's say, a German bond. This alters the exchange rate from the American dollar to the euro. The dollar depreciates compared to the euro because the dollar depreciated, it buys less of foreign goods, making foreign goods more expensive. This means imports go down since it's more expensive to purchase from foreign countries. Conversely, because the dollar depreciated, other countries find it relatively cheaper to purchase American goods and thus purchase more increasing exports. So price level decreases. The dollar, American dollar, depreciates, so it goes down in value. Exports increases, and then imports decrease. What happens to the overall net exports? If exports increases and imports decrease, then the overall net exports is going to increase. It's going to be a bigger positive number. So let's do a quick recap of all three of those things. When price level drops, consumers become wealthier, simulating demand for consumption. Consumption increases. When price levels drop, interest rates falls, stimulating demand for investments. Companies can afford to invest and buy more capital. People can buy more houses. Lastly, when the price level drops, the currency of our dollar depreciates, stimulating the demand for net exports. More people want to buy goods from America, more foreign countries want to buy goods from America, and we want to buy countries from foreign goods less. So imports goes down, exports goes up. Why would the aggregate demand curve shift? What factors shift the de aggregate demand curve? Anything that's going to shift this demand curve to the right or to the left is going to be anything that might affect aggregate demand other than price level. If price level changes, we're just moving along this line. If another thing changes, we're shifting the curve. Again, we can look at each one of these things. Changes in consumption can shift demand curve in one way or the other. Consider Americans that suddenly become more concerned about their savings. They want to start saving a bunch more than they were saving before. So they're going to reduce their consumption. Because the price, the quantity of goods and services is lower at any price because consumption has decreased, the curve is going to shift to the left. So I'll draw a new aggregate demand. We'll say it's AD2. And we can see that at any price level, like at P1, right, we're actually now at a lower quantity, quantity 3. So even though we're at the same price level, we're getting less stuff. Alternatively, a boom in the stock market will shift it to the right as less people are concerned about saving will be at this 83 aggregate demand 3 
So we can draw we can keep going the price level over. We'll be at this point and we can see our quantity at Q4 is higher than we were at the same price. So we're not spending anymore, but we're getting more goods. We can also see shifts come from investment. If firms are pessimistic about the future, they may cut back on investment spending. And this will shift the demand to the left, back to here. So then we'll be at the same price level, less goods. Policy can affect investment. If tax policy encourages investment firms or encourages investment, firms will invest more. The money supply can influence investment as well, and it can also influence demand. Remember, if we increase the money supply, the demand is going to increase. Interest rates are going to fall. When interest rates fall, it's going to stimulate investment. Alternatively, a decrease in the money supply is going to decrease investment. It's going to shift the demand curve to the left. Historically, we think the money supply is extremely important to shifts in the aggregate demand one way or the other. You're going to the right or to the left. We think money supply plays a huge role in the shifts for aggregate demand. Shifts from government purchases. I know we ignored it previously when we were talking about it, but we can see that when policies do change, because this isn't the aggregate demand right now, this is long run or short run. We haven't actually gotten to the short run part. So when policy does change one way or the other, it might affect aggregate demand. Whether the government purchases more, it might shift the aggregate demand to here because the government purchases increased, so real GDP increased. Or if they decide to purchase less, we might end up being here. Lastly, we can see shifts arising from changes in net exports. Any changes in net exports is going to cause a shift. Say a recession abroad occurs, then the countries facing the recession will purchase less from the United States because their money has depreciated, it's not worth as much, shifting it to the left. Because imports increase, exports decrease, now we have a negative number which makes GDP decrease. International speculators can also shift the demand curve. Say they believe that in the future America is not going to do so well. They're going to shift their American dollars to foreign dollars, depreciating the dollar making American goods cheaper, increasing exports, and decreasing imports. Conversely, if they think America will do well, then they're going to shift their dollars into American dollars. If they have foreign dollars, they're going to shift them to American dollars, and that's going to decrease exports and increase imports because the, the value of the dollar is stronger, so we can afford more foreign goods, and people can afford American goods less. So it's going to shift the demand curve to the left. That covers everything I wanted to say about the aggregate demand curve. Now we're going to look at the aggregate supply curve. The aggregate supply tells us the quantity of goods and services produced by firms at any given price level. Unlike the demand curve that is always downward sloped, the supply curve depends on the time horizon examined. In the long run, it's going to be vertical, and in the short run, it is going to be positively sloped. Why is the aggregate supply vertical in the long run? In the long run, real GDP is determined by labor, capital, and natural resources, and on the av available technology. This is the classical assumption case. When money does not affect real GDP, let's, I'll, I'll draw it here. We're going to have price level on the y-axis draw the axes. On the x-axis we have quantity of output. We're going to have a straight line up. We will call it the LRAS for long run aggregate supply. I'll spell it long run aggregate supply.
Now we can see that at any price level, it's the same quantity. We're at P1, draw a line straight across, we're at this point, Q. P2, we're still at this point. That occurs for any any P you can think of. If you wanted to think of P infinity up here, you could draw it across. And then we would have a line going through and we would still be at Q. What shifts that long run aggregate supply? Well, anything that changes, quantity of labor, quantity of capital, and the natural resources or technology. Let's look into each case. For labor, what might change labor? Immigration or emigration. If immigration occurs, the supply is going to shift to the right. We'll have a new line right here. L R A S2. Because we have more workers in our economy, we can hire more people, we can produce more. If emigration occurs, we're going to have the exact opposite. Oh, this will be Q1. If emigration occurs, which is when people are leaving your country to go settle down in other countries, we will be at this point. We'll, we'll, we'll have a shift the long run agate supply to the left at Q2. Here we can see that production increased or the output increased and here the output decreased. The natural rate of unemployment is also important. It determines how many people are working. So if something causes the natural rate to increase, that's going to shift the long run aggregate supply to the left and vice versa. If you have something that causes natural rate to decrease, which means more people are working, it's going to shift it to the right. Now let's look into capital, whether it's physical capital, such as machines or tools, or human capital, like education or knowledge, experience. An increase in capital, physical or human capital, shifts to the right, and a left if there's a decrease. That covers capital. Natural resources, which depends on lands, minerals, and weather. If a mineral deposit is found, or an oil field is found, or we do imperialism and we get new land, it will increase the long run aggregate supply. It'll, it'll shift it to this, this case, where we're at uh, long run aggregate supply 2 at Q1. Our quantities increase because we have more resources to build. If weather is bad or in one year it's worse, it might shift. Or I, it wouldn't be one year because it's long run. So it would have to be a complete change, such as global warming. It, it might shift the long run aggregate supply to the left if the weather is not productive or not conclusive to a productive environment. If the weather shifts to a world where it's, we could be more productive and crops grow better, then it might actually increase to the right. That covers natural resources. Lastly, we need to look at technological knowledge. The biggest factors for shifts are from the technology. If we look at the the technological boom that allowed people to expand and farm better, our populations increased drastically and we were able to produce a lot more. And even in the past hundred years, we can look at the effects computers have had. When computers were discovered, the long run agate supply shift really far to the right. And, and most of the time when there are technological advancements or usually just technological changes in general, it's going to shift to the right. There are some cases where it might shift to the left. Let's say if a government bans a particular method of production, that's kind of decreasing technology because it's like a forbidden technology. So it would shift it to the left. 
but most of the time changes in technology will shift it to the right. Now let's look at aggregate demand and long run aggregate supply together and we will look at growth and inflation. So again we have price level on the y-axis quantity of output. So we have our aggregate demand and we are going to have our long run aggregate supply. Let's look at a shift in demand. Let's say there's a positive shift in demand. What's going to happen? So if demand shifts to the right, do an arrow. So be our aggregate demand one. We can see we're at this point. Before we were, oh, my apologies for that. Before we were at this point, this Q, and we were at price level one. Now we're at this one at price level two. So as demand increased, all that really occurred was inflation. We didn't have economic growth. The long run aggregate supply didn't shift. We didn't move quantities. We just changed the price level. Price level increased. Now what happens if aggregate demand shrinks or it moves to the left? We'll be at this point. P3. So prices decreased and we're enjoying the same amount of goods. This would be known as deflation when price levels decrease. And we'll call this one AD2. But that's not the only thing that can shift in this graph. We can also have long run aggregate supply shift. Let's say that there's an increase in technology or an increase in capital, increase in labor, increase in l land, natural resources, we're going to have an increase in the long run aggregate supply. Draw a line straight up. Long run aggregate supply one. In this case, we are experiencing more goods, which means there's been growth we have a higher quantity than before. Our output's increased. And we can also see what happens in the original case. So if aggregate demand did not shift with the long run aggregate supply, we'll be right here at P3. So we have lower prices and more goods. If we look at, let's say aggregate demand and long run aggregate supply shift, we might be here it would be hard to tell because we don't know how much each line graphed or sorry each line shifted if one shifts more than the other we could have different results but you can see in each case kind of where we would be at if aggregate demand and uh, aggregate demand shifts to the left and long run aggregate supply shifts to the right we don't really know where our quantity is but we know our prices are significantly lower Now, of course, long run aggregate supply can shift to the left as well, in which case we would be here at long run aggregate supply three.
And if we look at the original case where aggregate demand did not change, we'll be here. And this will be Q2, where our prices increased to P4. And our quantities decreased. So we're paying more for less. That covers how the aggregate demand and the long run aggregate supply react to each other that and, and it shows in each case in each shift we can see the relationship form when long run aggregate supply increases we have lower prices and a higher quantity when long run aggregate supply decreases shifts to the left we have higher prices and less quantity less output when aggregate demand shifts to the right and long run aggregate supply did not change. Then we just have inflation. Our prices just increased. When aggregate demand shifts to the left, we have deflation, where prices just lowered. This is the classical model. This is what they thought was going on. They didn't pay attention to demand because they didn't think it was important. It doesn't really matter what happens to demand. We don't really care where demand is as long as there's production, as long as there's increases in production, they thought that as long as this long run aggregate supply was shifting to the right more and more, we'd be better and better off because we're getting more goods for less for less price, less money. But they failed to realize the short run. Now let's look into the aggregate supply curve in the short run. The aggregate supply in the short run slopes upward. So again, we're going to have price level, quantity of output. We're going to have our short run aggregate supply, and it's going to look like, may seem a little familiar, short run aggregate supply. I'll write it up here again. Why does the aggregate supply slope upward? Let's cover this first. Price level will affect output in the short run, according to this, this line. Economists have three reasons why the short run deviates from its long run output. Three reasons why these nominal variables might have effect on our real variables. Now, all three of these are going to have this kind of logic embedded into it or this kind of result that is quantity of output supplied is going to deviate from its long run or natural level when the actual price level in the economy deviates from the price level people expected to prevail when price level increases above the predicted amount output will rise above its natural level and when price levels fall below the expected level output falls below its natural level now let's go into the three reasons why. First we have the sticky wage theory. So number one, sticky wage theory. Wages between workers and their employers are usually stuck for periods of time. Contracts between the employer and the employee fix the wage for some amount of years. Let's imagine a firm that has a contract with its workers to pay them $20 per hour. And they expect the price level in a year to be 100. But when it comes around, the when the year is over, the price level is actually 95. The firm gets 5% less than the expected amount for each unit it sells. 
the cost of labor is stuck, so the firm hires less workers and produces less amount because their profits are lower than they expect, so they need to cut some costs in order to maintain the same level. Over time, when the contract expires, the firm can renegotiate, and in the long run, it can produce the normal amount. They can now readjust their expected price level amount, and they can say, oh, well, instead of it being at 100, it's now 95. We can renegotiate the, the wages, and now I can produce more than what I was during that short period. So in that short period, I was able to produce less because wages were a little bit higher than I would have wanted because I expected price level to be higher than what it actually was. Now let's say the price level ended up being 105 instead and wages are at 20. It's going to hire more workers and it's going to produce more because now their profits are higher. So they want to produce more goods. The prices are higher, they want to produce more. So they are going to hire more workers. They're going to increase production. We're going to have an increase in quantity. So in this case, because of the wages in the short run, we're going to ha sometimes be increasing production and or sometimes decreasing production depending on our expi expected price levels. So according to the sticky wage theory, the short run aggregate supply curve slopes upward because nominal wages are, bases, are based on expected prices and are slow to react. The, the key here is that there's a lag between the price level, the expected price level, and when they can change the wages. Economists prefer the this theory to the other two options generally. Like most economists believe that the wage theory is the prevailing concept or idea, but there's three ideas and really all three of them could be happening and all three of them could be producing this line. So the second one is going to be the sticky wage, no, not wage, it's going to be price theory. This is going to be similar to the sticky wage theory, but we're going to look at prices. So similar to the sticky wage theory, the sticky price theory is that prices cannot react quick enough to the changes in price level or the expected price level. These are often called menu costs. So it costs money in order to new cat to order new catalogs or order new menus or to change out the price tags. So it's a menu cost. If you if I want to increase my prices, I have to tell the consumers that my price for the good that I'm selling has increased in some way. Well, it costs me some sort of effort or some sort of money to actually do that. It's becoming less of an issue now with automated things. Like you just scan a barcode and it tells you the new price or you have automatic price billboards where you, or not billboards, but you know when you go into a restaurant, there's an automatic menu there. They could just type in the price and automatically change it like really quickly. So the menu costs are decreasing. But maybe if you think about restaurants, when they go in, they have a menu that you can look at and it can be pretty costly to swap out all of those new menus just to change the the burrito from $5 to $5.20. Maybe they just take that 20 cent loss for now and eventually they'll change it in the long run. Well, let's assume price levels suddenly drop. Some firms are going to be slow to adjust their prices to avoid the menu costs and thus their prices are higher than they should be. They're too high. And because of that, people are buying less and they begin to produce less because they're not making as much money as they were. Less people are going there. So they hire fewer workers, maybe fire a few people. So as you can see, production output decreased when the price level dropped. So price level dropped. Let's say we're here, price level drops, the quantity of output drops. Let's look at the other case. When price level increases and firms don't adjust quick enough, their prices are too low and attract consumers, leading to an increase in employment and production. All of a sudden, there's a lot more business. So when the price level increases and they're slow to adjust, they're going to start producing more. That covers sticky price theory. The last theory is called the misperceptions theory. 
I think this one's the hardest conceptually. Firms may notice that the relative price of their industry changes before the price changes in the overall economy. Let's take a wheat farmer. He may see the prices of wheat drop before seeing the prices of the other goods in the economy drop and mistakenly assume that the reward for being a wheat farmer is lower than before relatively to the to the economy. So he cuts production and fires workers. When in reality he should have just been like, oh, it's a whole economy dropping the price level rather than just wheat farmers. So he wouldn't need to make those cuts. Workers may also see this effect. They see their wages drop before price drops, so they erroneously believe work is not as rewarding and reduce the quantity of labor they supply. Let's say the business owner comes to them, tells them that their wages are going to drop, and they don't see in the economy that prices have really dropped. So they're maybe making less money, and they don't seem to put in as much effort as they did before because they're not earning as much as they did. So they reduce maybe the amount of hours they choose to work at the company, or maybe they just quit because working is no longer worth it. That covers why the short run aggregate supply has these three or this positive slope. Sorry. Number three was the misperceptions theory. The misperceptions theory. What would shift the aggregate? Sorry, what would shift the short run aggregate supply? The same variables that shift the long run aggregate supply also shift the short run aggregate supply. We, however, we need to consider an additional variable. Remember in these three cases, the sticky wage theory, the sticky price theory, the misperception theory, there's an idea of expected prices or an expectation. We're going to include this variable. We're going to include the expected price level. When the expected price level changes, we can expect shifts in the short run aggregate supply. An increase of expected price level will shift the curve to the left. A decrease shifts it to the right. So a decrease in expected price level will shift it to the to the right. An increase in expected price level will shift the curve to the left. We will end up here. And an decrease will shift it to the right. We have our aggregate demand and we have our aggregate supply now. Let's combine them. This will be our price level. This will be quantity. of output we're going to have our aggregate demand our short run aggregate supply and our long run aggregate supply Now let's go back to the business cycle, the economic fluctuations. What are going to be two causes of economic fluctuations? We're going to have a shift in demand 
we can see aggregate demand shift to the left, shift to the right. That will cause maybe some business cycle events to occur. If the aggregate man demand shifts to the right, we're going to be in a expansionary period because we're going to have an increase in production. It's going to be growth. If aggregate demand increases, we might have increased prices, but there's an increase in growth. If aggregate demand, let's 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 take a pessimistic country for whatever reason, we'll have a left shift contraction in the aggregate demand. So let's draw this. Our aggregate demand. It's going to shift. I use blue because it's the country has the blues. It's pessimistic. A, D, 1. We're going to have this point in the long run. We're also going to have this point in the short run. And this is where we were. We'll say this is point A, point B, point C. We start at point A, and then when we shift the graph, we are at the short run. We're going to move to point B, where we see prices are lower and our quantity is lower. We're paying less for less. Going off the sticky wage theory, price levels are lower than expected. And why is that? Well, this was our price level. We were at P1. Now, all of a sudden, in the short run, we are at price two. We're at a lower price level than expected. This shifts the aggregate supply, the short run aggregate supply, uh, to point C, the new long run equilibrium, back to the natural level of output. So we're going to shift the long run aggregate supply. Now we're at point C. And at point C, what happened? We have P3. And we're still at quantity. So now price has just decreased in the long run. In the short run, however, we had temporary, temporarily had less production. We had a contraction. Our quantity was smaller than before. We were producing less. This would be a recession. However, this is assuming that aggregate demand doesn't change. So we're here, aggregate demand shifts to the left, and we're assuming that if we're left at point B, we'll just naturally adjust back to C. And that is true. In the long run, we will do that. However, policymakers can reduce the effect of this. If policy policymakers react quick enough to the contraction, they can increase money supply. And when they increase money supply, it's going to stimulate demand. It's going to increase investment, increase consumption. And that can push the aggregate demand back closer here so we might be at this point instead, and it's quicker to get back to the natural rate of output. Even though prices might be a little bit higher than C, we might just even stay at A, theoretically. If we, if we were able to perfectly adjust the money supply immediately to the contraction, then we could completely negate the effect of the recession. It can also reduce the severity of it. If the smaller the aggregate demand, shift is, the less severe this recession will be. Let's look at two big shifts that have occurred in the aggregate demand. We have the Great Depression, which was probably the biggest that we have seen. We could see in this graph that in 1929, this, this first red bar 
or shaded bar is the Great Depression. And then we can see the percent change in real GDP from three years earlier. It decreased drastically. It dropped right off a cliff down to negative numbers. So we were contracting in our economy. It was getting smaller. It's a depression. This was, you know, a lot of people don't know exactly why the Great Depression occurred. Most economists place blame on a decrease in the money supply. Households were withdrawing their, withdrawing their money from banks. Others say that it was the stock prices dropping 90%, depressing household wealth. Whatever the case, the lower money supply made it harder for firms to invest. And that caused a decrease in investment. So you can see all these things were just all falling all of a sudden. Well, we see all of a sudden that this there's a huge bump. We, we can see kind of like two bumps. We had one here and then like one here. These bumps were caused by World War II. This, during this time period, the our production doubled. Our, our production of goods and services actually doubled. So it, two times what it was. That's a 200% increase. And it led to like 20% increase in price levels. They had some price controls to try to control the inflation that was occurring however unemployment fell from 17 percent to one percent that's fantastic and we we can figure out why this is right the when world war ii started 1938 Euro, the Euro, europe began their war with germany and italy and it increased the production we are selling goods to europe which forced our factories open. We started exporting things, which kind of got our, our factories rolling again. Later in the 40s, we became more heavily involved in the war. After Pearl Harbor, we joined the war, and all of a sudden our factories needed to be completely engaged, and we needed to have labor force. We needed more laborers, so we introduced a lot of policies to try and encourage people to work. All of these things contributed to a really successful growth period in the United States. We also have another change that was the recession in the 2008-2009. It began a few years earlier than 2008-2009. What, what caused the 2008-2009 recession? It began a few years earlier with low interest rates and a mortgage market that made it easier for subprime borrowers which are people who are at high risk of defaulting to get homes and loans. The loans and or home loans also were then bundled together to create mortgage backed securities. These mortgage backed securities were sold to other financial institutions and banks who may have not fully appreciated the risks in the bundles started to buy them. Some economists blame poor regulations for the high risk loans. Others blame misguided government policy encouraging high-risk lending in an effort to make home ownership more attainable for low-income families. These forces drove up housing prices by more than double from 1995 to 2006. So everybody was seeing these increase in housing prices. They wanted to get in on the action. They started buying these mortgage-backed securities, they kept selling these houses to these subprime borrowers who may not pay off their loans or not pay back them at all. Well, from 2006 to 2009, prices fell by 30%. And this is kind of what got the ball, ball rolling, what, what caused the main issue is this price drop. When the price dropped, many homeowners owed more than their house was now worth. Because they bar borrowed a certain amount of money thinking their house was $200,000 price dropped now their house is like a hundred thousand but they still owed two hundred thousand dollars so they decided you know what i'm just not going to pay off my loan it's not going to pay it back i don't need it because i'm not going to pay more than what my house is is worth the banks began to kind of take back the homes because if when you when you want to go for a home loan you mortgage your house or whatever to get some sort of money or maybe you just want the home loan and you 
the bank gives you money to buy a house and you pay back until they own the house until you pay it all the way back and then it's your house and you can also mortgage your house as like leverage to get money from banks to maybe work for or maybe start a business or to invest or something or maybe to fix the house up or something like that well these banks weren't getting their loans back they they weren't getting their money back so all of a sudden they had huge deficits so they began to take back the homes from these subprime borrowers and selling them off to recoup what they could from the bad loans this only exacerbated the the problem of the decreasing in prices for housing since now they increase supply if you have a typical long-run aggregate or long-run supply or not long-run just a supply and demand so you're you're just here and you shift your supply over here what happened to prices they actually decreased they went down we can can let it look at it from here so let's say we're here and we shift our our supply to the right we're gonna end up at this point right here at this point where our prices are lower than before and quantities higher which is an increase in supply so they actually just made the situation worse the financial institutions that carried these mortgage-backed securities were betting that house prices would just keep increasing and when they fell these financial institutions and these banks went nearly bankrupt they could not afford to channel their resources to those who could use them best even people who had extremely good credit found that they were unable to borrow money and invest. This reduces investment, reduces consumption, cause it, it, it causes the economy to slow down. The government reacted to this. The Fed began to buy these mortgages and to lower interest rates, which to help stimulate investment back up, to push it back. That was one, one thing they did. Next, Congress approved a $700 billion in the Treasury Fund to rescue financial systems from by injecting capital into the banks. So they just were like, hey, here you go, Chase. Here's two, $200 billion so that the, the, the banks could start operating again and start giving out loans to make more money. And then Obama also increased government spending when he entered office. All of these... So what that 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 covers a few of these economic fluctuations I want to talk about in terms of history. Let's look at shifts in supply. We saw a shift in demand what happens there. But that's not the case cuz well that's not all the cases because supply can often also shift. Where did my Oh there it is. was price level all right so those were all examples of a shift in aggregate demand we had the Great Depression World War two and the Great Recession let's look at some shifts to supply or short run aggregate supply let's assume a bad store storm happens and knocks out some crops, shifting the short-run aggregate supply to the left. Previously, we were at this point. We enjoyed this quantity. And we enjoyed this price level. We'll call it P1. Now we are at this point. We'll call P2. 
and we have a decrease in quantity. In this case, so when aggregate demand shifted to the left, we had a decrease in prices and a decrease in quantity. However, when the short run aggregate supply shifts to the left, we have a different scenario. We have prices increasing and quantity decreasing. So this is stag stagnation because we aren't producing as much and inflation when prices are increasing. This is sometimes referred to as stagflation. Just combine the words, you get stagflation. So price levels are higher and quantities lower. The higher the price level, it's higher than what was expected, which causes workers to negotiate for higher wages because they can't afford the higher prices. And firms' cost will rise again once they renegotiate. And this causes the short run aggregate supply to shift even further again. So then you'll get another line up here. The, it'll be a smaller shift. So when the workers renegotiate their wages, they ask for more wages because the price level was higher than they expected. This can create a cycle because again, if we look at this point, the price level is again higher than they expected. And they're gonna ask for more money. At some point, well, we'll call this the wage price spiral. At some point, the wages and prices slow down. So it doesn't just keep moving up forever and ever. And when this does happen, when it eventually slows, the low level of output and employment will put downward pressure on workers' wages. Why would this happen if workers are constantly arguing for more money? Well, as we are pushing to the left, if we keep going up and up, unemployment keeps going higher and higher. Workers then have less bargaining power for higher wages because it's easier to replace somebody with an unemployed worker. If there's a group of people who want to work and they aren't working, you can usually offer them a job at a lower price than maybe somebody who's already working right now. So this lessens the bargaining power of the workers when unemployment is high. And as this wage price spiral continues to push the short run aggregate supply all the way over, eventually unemployment will lower the bargaining power so much that the firm can start pushing back down. And when that occurs, wages begin to fall and it becomes more profitable to produce more goods. And the aggregate supply at this case is gonna eventually push all the way back to the natural rate. And we'll be back exactly where we started. But it's time consuming. Can be can take a while. And note that this is only if aggregate demand stays constant. Policymakers may try to adjust for the shock and stimulate aggregate demand. Let's see what this looks like. So we had our short run aggregate supply shift to the left. Policymakers want to adjust for this increase in prices and, and decrease in quantity. They want to account for this. So they're going to try to stimulate aggregate demand again. And when they stimulate the aggregate demand by maybe increasing the money supply, we're going to push aggregate demand to this point, aggregate demand two. And we'll arrive at this point. At this point, in the long run, we'll be at P3 and Q, just Q. So instead of having quantity decrease, we just, we just push aggregate demand and we, we just receive inflation. We don't wanna deal with the decrease in quantity, our, our decrease in the economy, so we just increase aggregate demand to arrive at a higher inflation. Again, this may not be a problem. Classical economy, money neutrality, that money does not necessarily affect the long run output. So being here, prices, it doesn't matter if prices are higher 
because our quantities higher, wages will be higher, everything will be higher. Now, real cases of stagflation for for a long time, economists didn't actually see this effect. It wasn't until the 70s that re really shocked economists. We had this huge stagflation because of a decrease in the supply for oil. During this time, OPEC was created and they artificially decreased the supply of oil in the world market. So it was a short run aggregate supply shifted to the left and then we are here. We kept seeing inflation and we saw less quantity. We saw less output. Eventually, we pushed ourselves back to around here. We just had inflation happen and our, our quantity remained the same. Or, I mean, there's still quantity growth, but it went back to its like normal rate. Now this covers lecture five. I know it was long. Let's go over a little history about how this model was developed. It was written about in the midst of the Great Depression by none other than the by John Maynard Keynes. He's probably one of the most influential economists of all times. Up there or even surpassing Adam Smith, Karl Marx, or David Ricardo. He criticized classical economists' attention to the long run and ignorance of the short run. I'm just going to end with a quote from him. The long run is a misleading guide to current affairs. In the long run, we are all dead. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task if in tempestuous seasons they can only tell us when the storm is long past, the ocean will be flat. What he meant by this is in the long run, if it doesn't really matter what's going to happen because it's always going to resolve itself. But in the short run, when we're going through a storm, economists can't help anybody if all we say that this, when the storm's over, everything's going to be fine. Thank you. That covers chapter 20, lecture 5. Make sure to do the homework. I'll see you guys in two weeks. Take care.